everybody. Thanks for checking out our power chat. Uh, we're really happy to have a dear friend, colleague, uh, longtime collaborator, Andy Akiho joining us. Um, that was the, the tapping that you heard was not typing. It was actually applause from inside the computer for Andy. Uh, but yeah, so we're, we're really, really happy to have uh, Andy here. How are you? Good. Good to see you guys. Thanks yeah, you too. It's, it's it's been a second. Um, yeah. We were just chatting before we got started, and I didn't realize that um, you had actually moved to Portland. Um, but I was I was one of the things that I was really interested in, kind of picking your brain a little bit about, is before you um, had moved sort of more permanently or more singularly in Portland, you were going back and forth from New York and Portland. And I remember you telling me how you just got like better work done there. That was kind of the impetus for the move. Um, I wonder, can you talk a little bit about like how how space or where you are influences the way you write and like what it is about being in a, a different place that helps you be more productive or, or work better? It's Yeah, it's more just I like newness and I like to write in new environments. So uh, I just, I was just in New York and I got more work done there <laughs> now that I live here. <laughs> because that was the new feeling. So depending on where I am, uh, it just inspires new, new, new work and, and a new atmosphere to, to just be only in the zone for that. You know, usually when I'm going somewhere too, I, I feel like, okay, I'm going there to get this one thing done. So it's, it's, it's laser focused on, on the new area, you know, and then the environment always uh, influences me. So then where's your second place going to be now that you have one place? <laughs> well, there was never a second place. It was always just another place. So I could be in China or I could be in like, I don't know, Rome or Portland or San Francisco, wherever. It's just that I, I just like, I like creating many residencies kind of wherever I'm not living, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I like that. Do you, um, so like, what are you, what are you working on now? Like what's a, what's a thing that's been taking up a lot of your focus or that you're like really sort of laser focused in on? Yeah. Right now it's definitely seven pillars still. Um, it's a piece I'm writing for sandbox percussion and it's, uh, it's like a 75 minute long 11 movement piece. Uh, and we're, we've been recording that kind of as, as soon as I finish a movement, we record it and um, trying to do some uh, some videos with that too. So. Can you talk more about the piece? Like what's the, what are the seven pillars or what's the sort of over, overall concept of the thing? Well, there's no like specific narrative. Um, we tried to fit that into something, but it's it wasn't real, so. It's really about the music and about the architecture of the music. Um, so the seven pillars are very structured. Um, and there's four solos too, featuring each of the members of the, of the quartet. And those are more um, from in, within kind of, just like intuitive feeling. Um, yeah, they, they, don't, they don't really have structure besides what's intuitive. But the pillars are very structured and that features all four members. And it's like this palindrome thing um, based on either side of the, the, the piece. I know you've written a lot for percussion. And when we first met you, you it was as a percussionist. And then we quickly found out you were a crazy steel pan player also. I know you've written more than a few pieces involving percussion going back to your trio days. and. Uh, the snare solo really remembers sticks out to me as a cool piece. But how do you feel like the influence of yourself as a percussionist is informing this piece? Um, it's more and it's more like I can I can come from it from my experience as a percussionist. You know what I mean? So so like current like I when when I was writing or becoming more of a composer and and writing for all the other instruments. It was like, okay, what, what's the most I can learn about each one of those? And now going back to this piece, um, I'm going to something I already know, but I'm trying to come at it from a, like um, a naive place. 
like, so if I'm writing for the vibraphone, I'm just approaching it as anything, coming up to it, hitting it, whatever sticks I can, and just kind of creating these new sounds that as if I'd never seen an instrument in my life. I, I didn't purposely go, let me try to do that, but it's just kind of my personality to do that anyways, um, whether I know the instrument or not, but it's kind of fun doing that and kind of creating a new sound world for me, you know? Yeah, that sounds really super fun. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. Direction. You were, you were talking about the like, uh, you know, seven, seven movements, seven pillars and these four solos and palindrome structures and things. And I was, it, it made me think of uh, the haikus piece that, that you wrote for Load Bang. And it's very, very much focused on these sevens and fives in all kinds of permutations. Uh, when you're starting a piece, do you often uh, begin with these kinds of, these kinds of number games for like large forms or rhythmic cells, or does it sort of vary from piece to piece? It definitely varies from piece to piece, but I love starting from somewhere that has some kind of backbone or some kind of architecture. Not that I might not even necessarily stick with it, but I, I, I remember sticking with it with the load bang piece and with the piece I'm working with now. And sometimes, even if I forget whatever I did with the architecture and all that, it sometimes creates some kind of subconscious way of me telling the narrative, even the abstract portions of it it just it has something that relates it it feels like it's deeper when I do it like that um but it's nice to do it without architecture too and just kind of let let the vibes roll and even though I'm putting the architecture in nobody needs to know or care it's more that it's something that helps me create that the the scaffolding and the you know the the building blocks or the, the foundation and then the, the other stuff is more of an intuitive place. You know, I don't want to just stick and, and be completely serial about it or anything, you know, or, um, but it does help me. It, it, it helps the creativity. You know, it, it helps free me up a little bit by not having unlimited choices a little bit. Right. It's something to push against or something to mm -hmm. hang on to as, as you move through it. And nobody, nobody could accuse you of, uh, not having the groove or the like freedom within especially the load bang piece has such a like it it has crazy uh overlapping patterns and things and some extraordinarily uh virtuosic rhythmic structures that we have to do especially i end up playing this like I don't even remember, is it 2116 over the everyone else's bars or something? Like I'm playing in my own meter on this pot for a whole thing. So I, I definitely feel that we have, we have all the numbers and then, and then we go someplace. It's not all about that. That's, that's something that always, always pops in your music. Oh, thanks. Uh, oh, sorry. And, one, and, one more yeah. thing with, with your piece. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, was, yeah. it had a lot of fives and sevens because it was haiku structure, you know? So I, w I wanted to keep that, the, the, the 17 and all that. Um, <laughs> No, I was wondering, Andy, if, if you could share with us a little bit about how your career uh, shifted from being a percussionist into being uh, a full-time composer. Like, what has changed? What, what moved you from one place to the other? Um, I think I just found myself just, I kind of just do what I'm ever in the zone of doing. So if I have to paint, this wall, that's all I think about, you know, like when I, I every, well, all the different color in here, but I, I just took that project over one day and that's what I wanted to do. And, and that's how I am with everything in music too. If, if I have a commission and I'm working on that, it becomes my life and I can't really do anything else. So a lot of it was just the logistics of it and because I love doing it. And it's because it's literally still the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. So I keep wanting to learn and get better at composing because I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And, and um, so, I mean, coming from a performing background, I still perform, um, but I just find, uh, I just, I don't know. If I, I, it takes more energy and time for me to finish a piece than to learn a piece at, at this moment. 
so I think it just kind of takes over my life and and that made me become I guess more of the title of a composer because it takes more of my physical time you know but um I still perform too a little bit um but I mainly I mainly only perform in stool pan these days and because I don't I want to do the I don't want to mess somebody else's stuff up and I don't have time to learn too much because I there's only so many hours in a day and I need to compose a lot I really only play my own music just because I I know it already and or somewhat know it <laughs> and and uh I don't know. It's just it's just more of a time thing. I, I want to do it all, but you can you can only do so much. So, <laughs> you know. I wanted to ask a question in kind of a similar vein. I feel like while you, me, Andy, and Jeff were in grad school together, we were kind of watching you take your first steps as a composer. I know you had your trio project with Kenneth and um, what was it? Steel pans, drums, and cellos. Mm -hmm. But I feel like we watched you like really craft your first full pieces. One of them with like the 16 foot PVC pipe and the fans and stuff like that and all these big maximalist ideas. Um, did you notice your thinking change? Did you make a conscious decision that you were going to move into composition? I know you say that once you get focused on one thing, it tends to become the thing that you do. But was there ever like a choice or a moment where it just clicked and you're just like, oh, this now? I, I think it was, um, I mean, right around that time, uh, and this, I'm not just saying this, this is literally inspired by you guys and everybody in the um, in the contemporary performance program at MSM because it was just a natural way to do it. It really, I don't remember the day I was going, I'm going to be a composer. <laughs> you know, it wasn't anything like that. It was like we were making music and we were experimenting and we we had this very limited time, two years of like, how are we gonna grow into what we're gonna become, you know, or, or that, that initial path, right? And I'd never really worked with classical musicians since I moved to New York. I was only doing steel pan gigs and in the Caribbean community. And so it was nice to have a new environment. That was my newness at that time, right? Cause I was, it, contemporary classical and all that was completely new to me at that moment in my life, um, outside of, you know, a little, a little dabbling in undergrad several years before that. But by the time I was at MSM and learning from you guys and the whole crew, like we just had a really awesome uh, cohort, right? And I was just inspired by everybody. I was like, okay, I wanna, let's write, let me, you know, let me do something for you. You know, and, and a lot of it started with me writing for myself to perform with you guys, cause I played this awkward instrument that wasn't quite, that prominent in classical, contemporary classical music. So it's like, okay, how can I use this instrument to perform with you guys and, and just, we, we make great experiences together. And that's what started it. And then I was super fortunate to be studying with Julia Wolf on the side of, of going to school there. And she, she never gave me that kind of feeling like, okay, you have to go to school for this. You have to do all this. Like, it wasn't like that. She just accepted me as a creator at that time. So it wasn't like, you know, I was, I was technically a percussionist at that time, but I was writing every night. I mean, I was writing as much as I was performing and that it just kind of took over a little bit more, you know, naturally, I think. Yeah, that's really wonderful. In fact, your relationship with Julia seems like maybe the exception to the rule from what I've seen a lot of other composition students go through. So thanks for sharing that with us. <laughs> It's a really interesting thing to think about as a teacher also like just not pushing students towards a thing they might not necessarily be what they want to do anyway yeah. yeah it's really that's fascinating to hear i wasn't so aware of that at the time yeah, yeah. i mean it was fun you know i think all of you inspired me and, and gave me confidence to just keep going for it um you know and uh, Ryko and Niels and everybody at at MSM too, you know, just even though I wasn't there getting a degree in composition, there was a lot of support, you know, and, and like I said, you know, Julie, Julie Wolf and the, the Bang on a Can crew, you know, everybody was just so supportive and even going to the festival uh, right around those times, it just kind of cemented that this could be a lifelong journey, you know what I mean?
<laughs> yeah. Speaking of, of lifelong journeys, uh, you're, you're a steel pan playing composer. So you have uh, by default already lived several different musical lives. Uh, what's the, where, where's the, where are the beginnings of your, your musical life and your musical story? How did you get into playing and writing music? The very beginnings are my sister starting me on drum set, like on rock drums, you know, like playing Metallica or whatever, you know, um, when I was a kid, she was a rock drummer. And then from there I went to, I did a lot of drum line and stuff in, in high school. And then by the time I got like to undergrad and went, went to North Texas for a year, I got really into jazz. And so, you know, all these things I was doing, um, and then obviously in undergrad and afterwards, I, I really got into steel pan and uh, going to Trinidad all the time, and being influenced by the, the culture and the, the music from Trinidad. But every one of these aspects, um, I would I would try to create it not not as a composer but just like how can I I just wanted to come up with things to to perform in with that um, and I was also really big into West African drumming um, in undergrad all throughout undergrad played June Junes a lot with West African dance troops and stuff like that so every every one of these pods of of I don't uh, musical genres or environments inspire what I did at that moment. And just as I kept growing and when I moved to New York right after undergrad or a little after undergrad, I was just playing in, um, in the uh, Caribbean community in New York and working in steel, steel pan bands and uh, the, those large steel orchestras basically, right? And so we were doing a lot of arrangements for that. Um, and that, the, the, those kind of things just naturally led into me morphing into this by the time I got to MSM with you guys in the contemporary program. It was just a, it was a weird background, but, uh, or a different journey. But, um, so that's why I have a lot of gaps and probably my formal training, obviously. But, um, but I have a lot of life experiences that I think I can try to relate instead of, instead of writing a book about it, I'll write music about each one of these experiences, you know, um, and and that goes towards style too. I don't I don't go okay. I'm gonna write this style like when I was in West African drum. Then I'm gonna write this style when I was in the Caribbean environment, or I'm gonna write this when I was really into bebop. It's just all part of who I am and how I grew up. And then I just tell the story in the music. Is there are there so I your your all of these influences come together in like very fluidly in in your music and i really i really appreciate that that i i feel like we can hear these things <laughs> in your music you know maybe maybe it's easier for us that you know we know your background than someone who just shows up and hears a piece in a concert and they might not know but are there uh i know there's some sort of like echoes and returns and reverberations in your work where your uh you know you have this beginning in drumline and now they're there are drum lines playing arrangements of pieces of yours, right? <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's nice to see this thing come full circle because I used to do drum corps and I forgot about that life. I didn't forget about it. It's just, it's just not what I'm in at, at the moment, right? Or the past couple decades, I haven't thought about that or really done much in it. So it was cool to hear that, you know, like Carolina Crown or, or Blue Coats and Oregon, like there, these different cores have done my my pieces and is is like okay then there must have been some obvious influence that I didn't even know was in there but they must have related to it and it's cool like especially going back to Crown a couple of years ago and hearing arrangements of Tom Hannum doing No One to No One and and Carolina Crown doing this as a drum core was it was just wild because I would have never in a million years imagined that especially the core I started in. I don't even know if a lot of them knew I marched there, but that was that was my roots when I was like in 1995, you know, like when I was a teenager doing these drumline things, right? And it's funny because I, I don't ever think, okay, I'm gonna write this drum core, drumline kind of perspective, you know, because it I don't, you know, you could get really pigeonholed into like this very specific type of style or or um I don't know. You you could you could go down a path of of sounding 
too much like one thing, right? But what's crazy is this, the last piece I just finished, pillar one, I wrote it all out of order, these pillars. And the last ensemble of the pillars, seven pillars was I finished pillar one. And for some reason, I literally went back to those roots insanely. Like it, I'm, I'm almost making fun of myself. Like it's so drumliney. It's like paradiddle cheese flam diddle. Oh, it's it's all in there. I mean, yeah, it's pretty funny how drumliney it is. Like it's it's hilarious. Um, but I'm I'm really happy with it, and I still think it's because of the architecture you're working in and the parallel. It's it's the palindrome uh, parallel to pillar seven, and working with that made it something that I wouldn't have done if I just said, I'm, I'm going to write a drumline type piece. And, and I did it and I didn't think going into it that I would write a drumline type piece, but it ended up turning into that because I guess my roots came out more and more on that one, you know? Um, so one thing that I've always noticed about you is you've always brought creativity to the instruments and what you're writing and how you're playing. I think of the fact that you were doing prepared steel pan with rubber bands or playing with chopsticks or doing multiple mallet Bach arrangements on steel pan. And um, it seems like it was a very, not a natural thing, but it made sense when I saw you were writing a concerto for ping pong players. <laughs> so I wanna know more about that, how that came about. And I also wanna know, uh, now that you've been approaching your percussion instruments from a place of like naivety and new thought, have you found out any new tricks that you're incorporating into the pillars piece? Yeah, that's a, I, I could talk two hours on that question, but I'll, I'll make it brief. Um, you know, the stuff you talked about with the pan and all that. So the rubber band things, that was from learning what a bar top pits is on a violin, right? And then, so, all right, I was thinking, all right, how can I do that for the vibraphone piece I was writing when I was writing To Walk Around in West Harlem? It's kind of like a modified paro ensemble one of the percussionists plays a vibraphone and I wanted to recreate these bar top pits, the snap. So we got these huge rubber bands. Um, and then, and with 21 using the rubber bands on the steel pan, it's, it's literally, how can I get uh, these unison bar top pits? I could do like four or five notes in a chord and have these super tight bar top pits on the steel pan. And it was just to create this sound world. It wasn't I don't want to think of it even even as a trick or, or a novelty. It's, it's literally just a means to the end. How can I grab that sound and recreate some of these? You know, it's just like when when a when a string player might mimic a percussion instrument. It's like how can we do the reverse of that? And it's not trying to do it just to do it. Neither. It's literally that's what I'm hearing. And and then I uh, applied it to that. And 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 in the chopsticks too. That comes from just like in steel pan music, just craving like a very articulate sound from the round overtone. You hear all the overtone series when you play a pan, when you play one pitch, you hear like all of them, right? It's, you definitely hear the octave, right? And then a lot of other things that are surrounding it. And so with the, with the chopstick, it's like, how can you create this hyper articulate attack? Not a round attack, more, more of like a, a, a spiky attack, but, um, but still have those crazy overtones ringing after. And I like that a lot. And I do that with a lot of percussion instruments, like playing with timbali sticks on the vibraphone or with the, um, we call them ligneous sticks now on the, on the marimba. Uh, it's like the, the, they're, they're missing the, the mallet head. So it's the, just the shafts of the sticks on marimba. And, um, you know, just recreating these different articulations. So, all right, so now going to the seven pillars, there's a lot with, with that too. Um, just just messing around with it literally like what can sound cool and i was just i would just um go up to it with a pair of drumsticks or went up to the glockenspiel with that and just started playing these crazy rhythms on it but I mean, you can hear the rhythm because of the articulation of the drumstick or the timbali stick but you still got this crazy overtone ring that comes from chopsticks on a pan it's just like how can because if you do it on chopsticks on a glockenspiel i've written a piece for that too but it but for um if you do that it'd just be much quieter, be much more intimate. And I wanted something like the, um, the, the timbali sticks on, on the, the glockenspiel, there's a solo that's just like this crazy nonstop soliloquy. And that's almost like the, um, his name Lucky on uh, Waiting for Godot. It's just like, he, this instrument's just on stage the whole time. It doesn't, it doesn't happen until like 
almost halfway through the 75 minute long piece and then all of a sudden it goes crazy it's just like this long soliloquy you know the solo for the glock um that terry's playing in the sandbox and um but all the other movements too just incorporating these new sounds like um like on a on a vibraphone like striking with the mallet and then immediately damping it's like you can get these cool sounds so, so they'll be on either side of the vibraphone doing these uh, back and forth like it's one person like it's it sounds like an electronic instrument or doing like I, I started experimenting this with the arrangement for to walk around in West Harlem for um, for percussion octet and I was just experimenting how can I recreate these um, or the flute this hospital beep sound right um, and I was thinking how can I do that with percussion it works really well with the touch fourth harmonics on the cello matching the the flute, like I can't tell the difference of the instruments when I hear it on record and, I'm, and I know the piece. I'm like the flute and the cello. So it's kind of creating these different hospital beats. I did that with the vibraphone and the crotales by doing like a, a bass bow or a cello bow and immediately dampening. So it's the opposite of what we normally try to get with bowing sounds on a, on a sustained instrument. You want it to ring out, right? These long bows, these beautiful long bows that are ringing out. But if you go whoop, whoop, like really quick on the, it's a, it's a tricky technique to control, but they're getting it down really well. And just doing that really quick on the crotales and the, and the vibraphone. And so pillar two to me sounds like aliens having tea, getting into an argument and then going to the disco afterwards. Um, and that's, and it's, it's these kind of electronic sounds that are happening acoustically. But that, that's just one of them. Like all of them have some kind of new, technique that I explored and, and that we also worked on together as a group. It made it fun, you know? I feel like <laughs> what a what a really fun description of a movement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if that's not going in the written program notes, you got a problem. That's gotta be oh yeah. You sure, have to right? keep sharing that one. Okay. Cool. Um well Andy, so we we're at about at our 30 minutes. And if you remember from our power concerts at MSM, we were pretty strict with the 20 minute rule. So we expanded it to 30 minutes, but we have a hard cut time. Um, really? But thanks so much for for hanging out with us tonight for chatting. It's so good to see you. It's so good to hear what you're up to. Um, can't wait to share a beer or a bowl of ramen in person sometime soon. Or both. Yeah, or both. <laughs> um, My pleasure. Yeah, man, great to see you. So glad to, to hear you're well and all these projects are so exciting. Can't wait to hear this sandbox piece. It sounds fantastic. Is there, um, for, for folks listening and for us, is there a release date? Is, is there a record being produced now? Yeah, it's gonna be this summer. We, we're not sure if it's gonna be June or August yet. It'll be one okay. of those probably. So look out for that. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't the answer. I just remembered I didn't answer the <laughs> ping pong too, but you can check that out. <laughs> <laughs> Same kind of same stuff, just ping pong. Same stuff though. <laughs> yeah. I really uh, well, appreciate talking with you guys. Thank you. Yeah, man, you too. Um, thank you all for listening. Our next one coming up is in a couple of weeks with composer Marty Epstein. So please uh, stay tuned for that. And we will see everyone very soon. Thank you. Thanks for checking right. it out. Thank you.